Sergeant's Green Scoops is a full-service lawn and landscape company located in Marion, Ohio. We specialize in making your home a beautiful place to enjoy your time. Fall is here and that means the leaves are falling. This year, let Sarge and the troops clean up that mess for you. We have the equipment and strong backs to handle any amount of leaves you may have. So sit back, relax, and let us take care of everything. Mention that you heard about us on Scotch Spears Now and receive 5% off any service. Also, ask about our senior citizen and veterans discounts. From landscaping to lawn care, mowing to leaf removal, Sarge and the troops can give you an outdoors to make your country proud. Find us on Facebook or call 740-751-5207. The Harding Center, located at 267 West Center Street in the heart of downtown Marion, is now accepting applications from adults, students, and seniors. The Harding Center is a beautiful historic building offering one-bedroom apartments and efficiencies at affordable rental rates. All utilities are included. Basic cable and internet are available. The Harding Center is equipped with an on-site laundry facility for its residents. The property is located on the Marion City Transit bus line and off-street parking is available. The Harding Center is managed by Starfish Building LLC Lois J. Fisher and Associates. For more information, contact them at hardingcenter at gmail.com or give them a call at 740-223-3288. The Harding Center, a beautiful place to live in the heart of downtown Mary. This is Scott Spears and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Scott Spears Now. Today we are going to delve back in your childhood with a character I know you are sure to remember, Bozo the Clown. The Bozo the Clown to be exact we're going to be talking with is the Bozo the Clown from WGN Television, Joey Dioria. Gonna be a lot of fun. Did you know that aside from being Bozo, Joey was also on The Gong Show, The Chuck Barris Game Show, The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson? the late uh, night program on NBC with David Letterman. He was on them all. And Bozo, for an amazing 17-year run, working with the likes of the legendary Roy Brown, Cookie, and Marshall Brodeen Wizzo. You are not gonna wanna miss this. It's very nostalgic. We even hear Bozo's voice creep out. You aren't gonna wanna miss this. A very unique and fun guy, Joey Dioria on Scott Spears Now. This is Scott Spears, and today we're going to have a lot of fun because we're going to delve into the annals of television and talk with one of the all-time great performers. From the Gong Show to the Bozo Show to David Letterman, Johnny Carson, he's done them all over the years. He is comic actor Joey Dioria. Joey, how are you? Okay, good to see you, Scott. Yes, always good to talk with you. I'm uh, glad to have you back on the show. And, and what's been new with you? Well, uh, let's see. Mm, not really much. Uh, just the day-to-day -day grind of, of an actor going from one audition to the next. <laughs> uh, I finished a small segment on a new Nickelodeon show called The Thundermans, which is about a family of superheroes. I play a school uh, science fair judge. Uh, I've been doing some voiceover work on video games, just finished one on a video game called, it'll take me a second to remember the name. <laughs> well, y y you know, uh, Joey, it's very interesting because people think that once you are established in this business, that you don't do auditions anymore, you're not so to, so to say, a working actor, people call you. Uh, not necessarily true. 
Well, no, no, they're, they're, that's not the case, uh, especially because I'm coming from a local market. Um, I was in Chicago. So coming out here to L.A., it's like starting all over again. They have you fill out your height and your weight and your ethnic background. Uh, one I went to, they asked any disabilities. I wrote over 50 in Hollywood. <laughs> that is tough, isn't it? Yeah. When you, uh, well, first of all, I, I don't know anything about this. How do you get scripts or auditions? Uh, well, you have a, an agent. Uh, I'm with uh, a, a very, very nice agent out here in L.A. Uh, they've mostly been handling me for, uh, on, for, uh, for voiceover work, uh, which is cartoons and animation. In fact, I just finished... Uh, I just finished a film called Jungle Shuffle, in which I am the voice of an accountant, <laughs> um, and that's uh, that. I think that will be a direct-to-video film. And uh, let's see. And then I, I just finished doing uh, several voices on the new Tom and Jerry series, which will be on the Cartoon Network. I'm the voice of uh, Spike the Cat. So. When you go to an audition, what is that like? What's the process? Uh, basically, uh, you, uh, you basically get a notification from your agent. Uh, if they have the copy ahead of time, they send it to you, and you get it as, a, as a, an attachment with your email, and you, you download it and print it out so you can go over it a few times before you go to the audition. Then you drive to the audition. One of the reasons why I was a little late getting to you today, I wanted to apologize for that, was that I was at an audition all the way in Santa Monica. And if uh, your listeners have heard anything about the 405 out here, they, they know that that can literally turn into a parking lot, and that was the case. So it took me a lot longer to get back home to Pasadena. When you figure all this in, the trips you take, the, the distances you have to drive, as, as in conjunction with the jobs you get, is it still worth it at this time in your career? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's what I do. Um, and fortunately, I like to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and in California, you have to like to drive. Do you miss Chicago at all? Oh, I miss Chicago greatly. Both my wife and I talk about Chicago all the time. We have so many old friends in Chicago. We uh, will probably be trying to get out there, we hope, sometime this winter to visit with some friends. Would, would you ever move back to the Midwest? Oh, yes. My, in fact, my wife and I were discussing that just the other night. Uh, now, our son works for Google. And uh, he's, he's a software programmer, and he lives up... Uh, in uh, San Marino, not San Marino, San Mateo, and um, one of the things that he does is that he's, he's working there, but if they ever had the opportunity for him to, uh, to transfer to Chicago, we would probably try to go back too because uh, we, we'd miss the grandchildren too much. Mm. I, I bet that's true. Uh, Joey, I want to go back to the start of your career here uh, and kind of start with the very beginning. Why did you choose this career? When did it appeal to you? Oh, it always did. I'm, I'm probably one of the first television babies. I mean, I grew up with, with the television right there in the house. Um, and I liked television and I liked the shows. And even as a small child, I, I felt this was what I wanted to do. Acting is very interesting to me because I, I'm not an actor, but you have to become someone else. Now, there seems to be two methods to this that I've heard from other actors, and one is that you have to totally give yourself over to the person to become that, that part, and the other method is that there's always some of you in that character no matter who it is. If nothing else, you kind of look like them. Uh, wh how do you approach an acting gig? Uh, I, I, I uh, approach it the same way uh, Sir John Gielgud does. Someone once asked uh, Sir John Gielgud what technique he used in creating a character. And he said, I pretend. Mm. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> how, how, how much of you is in there, though? 
When oh, quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. Um, uh, it's, it's very funny. There was a very thin line between me and Bozo, <laughs> and I spent the next 17 years erasing that line. <laughs> um, I also did, for instance, I played uh, Max Prince in the Neil Simon play Laughter on the 23rd Floor. And there was, it was very interesting because I was going through a lot of what he was going through uh, in regard to frustration with the fact that WGN was cutting our show down and was cutting our budget and there was an awful lot of that anger and frustration that that character was feeling that I was feeling at the time. So, uh, so many people, many people really enjoyed my performance <laughs> in that show. Had Bozo not been canceled in the end, how long would you have continued playing him? Oh, I don't know. Were I you really tired of know. it? No. Um, you know, it's it's funny because in, in, back in 2000, uh, when before the show was canceled, we were moving into a period where we thought would be a very great time for the show. Um, we had a director who we really liked. We had... Uh, we had the kind of backup support from the stagehands that we needed. We had a camera crew that was really with us. Um, and um, I was writing more and more of the shows, and we really felt that we were going to have a really good season, and then they, they, uh, they canceled us. <laughs> you, you know, it's interesting. Well, why did they cancel you? What reason was given? Oh, it... They didn't give a reason. Well, the reason they gave was, of course, that we were no longer getting the viewers. But the basic, honest answer would be money. Um, local television stations don't have to produce in-house children's shows anymore. Now, in order to have an FCC license, a station has to produce so many hours of news, so many hours of community uh, service uh, public uh, broadcast and so many hours of children's programming and nowadays they can get so much content for practically nothing they don't have to spend the money to hire the talent hire the writers uh, dedicate one's uh, studio to uh, a show costumes props cameramen uh, stagehands directors producers uh, they don't need all of that you know, it's kind of interesting because living in the Midwest, obviously, uh, your bozo was a staple here, as was Bob Bell's. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's interesting for this reason. What you say there is certainly true, but we had local uh, shows in Ohio, Flippo the Clown, Lucy's Toy Shop, for people who live here, they'll remember those. But uh, I had a very good friend, David Eaton, who did a lot of children's programming in uh, Dayton. Yeah. Absolutely, and yeah, there were a lot of great ones here, but those... Good Time, I think, was the show he did. Well, and you know, those went on for a while, but a lot mm -hmm. of those started to bite the dust in the 70s, and if definitely yes. not the 70s, the 80s. Because of cable television, the w exactly. yeah, the WGN Bozo was able to go on for a long time, and at one point, I remember the waiting list for tickets being something obscenely, some obscene amount of time. So when did that all begin to spiral the opposite direction? Well, I'm sure that if WGN had been able to, they probably would have canceled the show when Bob Bell retired. Mm. But they had that waiting list, and that was a public relations nightmare. They, they couldn't cancel the show with... I think they had like 10 years of, uh, of, of ticket requests. And the only reason that that thing happened was because of a clerical error. When they, when they did the show, they would say, if you'd like to come and see the Bozo show, send us a postcard. And people would send in postcards. Now, what they should have done was when they reached the maximum amount of tickets for that entire season, they should have said, we're stopping it. Uh, if you did not uh, hear from us, please uh, send in for a ticket next year. Uh, but they didn't. <laughs> they just kept getting more and more postcards and stuffing them into a filing cabinet. <laughs> and they would go through them, uh, you know, scrupulously to try to keep them in order. 
But after a while, they, they started filling up more and more drawers of that filing cabinet. And uh, so that was, that was why when Bob Bell retired, and he retired for health reasons, um, that they, they couldn't just end the show. They had to, uh, they had to find a uh, successor. I remember when you started on Bozo in the 80s, uh, Bozo was five days a week, 7 a.m., yes. and then it went to Sunday. Did that show ever rate in the rating? Yeah, I, did, did the, what were the ratings like on that oh, show? The ratings. Oh, our ratings were, were, were very good because we were in a prime time. People were getting ready to go to work, and kids were getting ready to go to school. There was an article in TV Guide where a fellow commented that his family had been chosen to be one of the Nielsen families. They, they put the box on top of the TV, and it would monitor what they watch. And this man uh, wrote in this article that he believed that he was going to take television up several notches by making sure they only watched the most uh, educational and intelligent shows on there. And the first day they set the box up on the TV, he's getting ready for work, his wife is getting ready for work, the kids are running in and out of the bedroom, and the TV is on, and the kids watch Bozo. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and he, went, he realized that he was he was putting that down and we were getting very high ratings for those reasons kids wanted the tv on mom and dad would have them eat their breakfast with the tv on and, and bozo would be on and, and that was one of the reasons why they they moved us to sundays that was a very valuable piece of television real estate which is why the wgn morning news show is so highly rated it's a great time People are getting ready for work. They want to hear some news. They want to hear some local gossip or local uh, goings on about town. It's uh, it's the perfect uh, time to do that. When the show moved to Sunday, did the ratings fall off? Oh yes, but you know, and uh, they moved us to Sundays. They did not give us a good lead in or a good follow up, and we did not get a lot of publicity. It was, it was a built-in obsolescence. The whole thing was, you know, contrived so that eventually the numbers would drop and they would have a reason to cancel. But, um, you know, they weren't going to do that until they ate up that, uh, that waiting list. Well, I want to go back here. We kind of got into it just through the art of conversation here. But uh, how did you get the role as Bozo? You were fairly established uh, doing other things at that time, the Gong Show. I, I was doing the Gong Show. I had just done the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Um, my wife read an article in the Christian Science Monitor in which Al Hall said that they have had the worst time finding anyone who they felt was right for the part. They held auditions in Chicago. They came out to the West Coast and held auditions for three days at KTLA Studios and saw every mime, juggler, Venice Beach street entertainer, birthday party clown in the business. But they did not find what they wanted. And what they needed was somebody who could be Bob Bell to Roy Brown's cookie. They needed an Abbott to his Costello, a Hardy to his Laurel someone who understood the mechanics of old-fashioned burlesque and vaudeville comedy, because that's what Bob Bell and Roy had been doing all those years. And uh, it was very funny, because when I heard about the auditions out here in, in L.A., I didn't go, because I, uh, I figured, well, I, I have no clown background, and I know a lot of guys who are mimes and jugglers and ex-circus clowns. I knew a lot of guys who would be perfect for this. And after they came and went, uh, they still hadn't found a replacement for Bob Bell. And my wife read this article in the Christian Science Monitor basically saying that. They wanted somebody who knew vaudeville and burlesque who wasn't 80 years old. So I sent them the videotape for my appearance on The Tonight Show 
And within a couple of weeks, I got a call from Al Hall, and uh, they flew me out to Chicago to audition with Roy. And um, I discovered that the way they did the Bozo show was not like uh, a typical television show where you had a script and you had to learn lines. You would get a, a one-page sheet of paper that would basically say, this is the situation, these are the props, um, Cookie wants to bake a cake, you help him, at the end of the thing you take the cake out of the oven, hit Cookie with cake. <laughs> and that was it. So basically, I would go there and we would, we would go through the, the bit, Roy had half a dozen gags that he would want to do, and the minute he would mention a certain gag, I would know where he was coming from, so I would give him the right setups so he could get out his punchlines. So, so that, was, uh, that was pretty much uh, how the audition went. Anyway, a few weeks later, I heard back from Al Hall, and they offered me the job. Going in to do that, it was it was kind of unique because, of course, bozos were in a lot of local markets. Yes. But but the Bob Bell bozo, because of being up on the big WGN, was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, taking over for him, how did you come up with your bozo? Um. Well, because I'm not from I mean, because I was living in the West Coast and uh, was not familiar with the show. Well, his show. I grew up watching Bozo in New York when I was a kid growing up. Um, the one thing that Al Hall, who was the producer, insisted upon was that I not watch Bob Bell or try to imitate Bob Bell in any way. Uh, they wanted a complete, clean slate. And so that, so I just... I just did it as a, as a straight man, uh, a vaudeville straight man. And that was pretty much what Ray Brown wanted. He's the one with the ton of fun. He's the ace with the crazy face. A mile of smiles and a laugh and a half. He's the clown that won't let you down. I'm Marcus Bozo, I'm Coco Bobby Brown. I'm radically, emphatically, in fact, I'm really Marcus Bozo. When he does a pie, the pie, I really go Marcus I'm crazy about the crown, and gracious is outrageous, but wow! I'm bonkers for foes! 7 o'clock weekday mornings on Channel 9. When you had to walk into Bob Bell's cast, who at that time included some, some pretty big names, you mentioned Roy Brown there as Cookie, and of course Marshall Brodeen, the legendary magician as Wizzo. Mm -hmm. You know, they had worked with, with Bob. Uh, how were they with you in the early stages? They were extremely kind. Roy Brown, Roy Brown, uh, I used to defer to Roy, and one day he took me aside and said, you have to be the boss. He says, I can't be funny if you're deferring to me. So, I mean, he, he insisted pretty much right, right, right away that, that I be the straight man and I take the lead. Uh, Roy knew the power of being a second banana, and he... He took pride in the fact that he was an excellent second banana. And he couldn't be an excellent second banana unless I was a good top banana. What was it like to work with? Because I think in a lot of people's minds, uh, he might have been the favorite character just simply for the kookiness. Uh, and, and the fact that Wizzo was unique to the WGN I show. I tell people, when I grow up, I want to be Marshall Brodeen. <laughs> he... Um, he is the happiest, most relaxed, kookiest guy you, you, you'd, you'd ever want to meet. Um, he, um, he, was, he was a wild card. And, and, and nine times out of ten, when Roy and I were working with Marshall, we would step back and we would give him as much rope as he needed. <laughs> and then we'd have to reel him in. 
You know, I know by the time the series ended, there were a lot of uh, other great cast members that came on, but you did uh, sadly lose Roy to, to illness, and Marshall did leave the show. How big a hit were those to take on the set, personally and just professionally, as the show went on? Well, of course it was a tremendous... Um, it was a cr tremendous loss to, to lose Roy. Um, Roy was very ill, and we had to have we had a number of people come in and fill in for him while he would be rec uh, recuperating. We had uh, Adrian Zmet. Uh, you might remember him from uh, from uh, T.J. Hooker with uh, William Shatner. Or, or not? Oh, oh no! Yes, yes, I'm with you on that. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, and he, uh, he was a Chicago guy, and he was in town, and he filled in for several weeks as a as a clown. We brought in Michael Emmel, who was a an actor friend of mine from L.A., who happened to be in Chicago, and he became Spiffy. Um, then we we held auditions. We we hired uh, two wonderful young ladies. Um, Kathy Schenkelberg, who played Pepper, and Michelle Gregory, who played Tunya. And, and they were wonderful. They, uh, they brought a whole new energy and dynamic to the show. And of course, uh, Robin Urich, who played Rusty the Handyman, who gave us that lovable goofball that, that we were missing with, with Roy. Was it hard to lose the magician? Not really, no. Uh, Marshall was a great third character, and the magic was a great element to have for a number of the bits. We would, of course, have to have bits that would incorporate certain bits of magic in order to accommodate his character. Um, but he, um, he continued to visit with us, even on a, not so much on a regular basis, pretty much up until the end. People can hear your voice now, and they've heard your voice in a lot of things. Great voiceover actor, as, as we talked about earlier on. Where did the bozo voice come from? Um, it was very funny. When I first started doing the character, I based it on a very good friend of mine out here on the West Coast, Milt Larson of the Magic Castle, who talked right about here. Every now and then, you know, he would get sort of silly, and it would be, yup, 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 right about there. And that was where I first started the bozo voice. And then eventually it slipped into my own, which became a little more adenoidal than I really speak. And I kind of liked it because it was a wise guy voice and there was a hint of Bugs Bunny in it, which, uh, which I always thought worked well for bozo because bozo, bozo was, a, was a smart aleck who, uh, who, who basically caused trouble. <laughs> What was it like to go through all those ping pong balls on the grand prize game? <laughs> uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I, I was, the the game was was wonderful. People used to think that the one thing that would drive me crazy sometimes is that people would say it's a game rigged, and it's like no. I mean, I would love it if we had a winner every single day. I mean, the prizes weren't coming out of my paycheck. So. <laughs> So, I mean, um, yeah, it was, it was a fun game, and uh, I'm amazed even to this day. In fact, I, I auditioned for a show, and one of the writers came out who told me that he and, uh, he and his, uh, his sister had been on the show as kids, and his sister had played the game. So people still talk about it. Would you ever do Bozo again? Um, I don't think so. Uh, not because of not wanting to, but because I don't think that it would ever come up. It's the old James Bond, never say never. Um, but right now they do have someone in Chicago who is wearing the suit and the wig uh, and appearing in the uh, parades out there. Did you keep anything? Did you keep the costume? No. No, I did not own any of the uh, 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 any of the costume pieces. I did keep my nose, <laughs> um, but the uh, but the wig and the shoes and the costume 
were all the property of WGN. And I would never have any place to wear that suit because Bozo is a copyrighted character, so it's not like I could go and do a convention somewhere mm. as Bozo. I, I understand. I want to talk a, uh, about the uh, Gong Show, working with uh, legendary Chuck Barris. Now, yes. first, uh, first of all, the gag on Chuck for years, of course. I don't know, maybe it's not a gag. We, we've all been rolling with this for years, uh, that he worked for the CIA and maybe offed a few people. Well, what's your take of Chuck Barris? I think he's probably one of the most clever and savvy showmen in television. Uh, I don't know what he's doing lately, but I have to say that back in the, uh, the mid-70s to early 80s, he, uh, he pretty much owned the airwaves. He had, he had game shows on practically every network. Uh, the Newlywed Game, The Dating Game, The Gong Show, The 99 Cent Beauty Pageant. He, he was cranking those things out. Do you believe his story? I read the book. Um, I don't know. I mean, he, he never gave me any indication when I was on the set of The Gung Show that he was a spy. But then again, if he was a really good spy, he wouldn't. <laughs> Did you like The Gung Show? I loved The Gung Show. Um, it was very funny because I was taking an improv comedy class at the time. And one of my classmates came in and announced that they were so desperate to get acts because they were using so many acts on the gong show. I mean, the show was on, I think, three days a week and, and, and I think a couple of times in the evening um, that, they were, that they were willing to hire union actors to just come on, do a stupid act, get booed off the stage and collect after a minimum which back then was 150 bucks, which was also my rent in those days. So I used to figure if I can do one bad act a month, I've got my rent covered. <laughs> so I would come on and I would do an act. I did one act where I had a large uh, matchbox and then I would have the offstage uh, uh, sound man play a recording of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing the Hallelujah Chorus at 78, and I would conduct it like it was a flea uh, choir. <laughs> and, that, and that got me booed off the stage. Uh, I did an act where I had the audience play, uh, where I had the band play Begin the Begin, and I beat a chair to splinters with an axe. I mean... <laughs> it, you know, the gong show was so different. Why do you think it's never made a comeback? I don't know. I, I heard that they tried to bring it back for a cable uh, a year or two ago. But I never heard anything else about it. I think certain things are right for their time. I, 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 agree, I agree with that. Johnny Carson, uh, that must be a, a certainly a memorable moment for you. Uh, a lot of people credit that show as being the, the highlight of their career. Memories yes. of Johnny Carson. Well, I... Um, I was hired to do my act, the, the, the Dr. Flamo act, by Johnny Carson's um, casting director, a man by the name of Jim McCulley. And I showed up at uh, NBC and rehearsed it, and McCulley gave me some notes, and just as I finished and was blowing out the candles, Johnny Carson walks in wearing a plaid, sort of a plaid shirt and a pair of jeans, and uh, he walks up to me and shakes my hand and says, how do you do? I'm John Carson. <laughs> and I said, uh-huh. And he went, uh, I just got here. I hear you're a very funny young man. I'm looking forward to seeing your act. And that was it. And then when I did the, uh, the gong show, I did the gong show, when I did the Tonight Show, uh, it really broke him up because he hadn't seen the rehearsal. In fact, you can probably still find my uh, Dr. Flamo on the uh, Tonight Show. I think that's still up on YouTube. I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. 
You know, one of the great things about working at WGN uh, during that big cable boom and, and during the 80s and early 90s, were there were substan some substantial names at WGN, Siskel mm -hmm. and Ebert. Yes. Do you have memories of them? Yeah, and it's, it's very funny. Um, they had their dressing room across the hall from mine, and uh, when Roy and I would be leaving, they'd be coming in. <laughs> and uh, actually... Uh, it was it was um, it was Roger Ebert who, uh, who who looked at us leaving and he went, "It's amazing, a tall I was said a thin one and a fat one leave and a thin one and a fat one show up." <laughs> Sad we've lost both of them. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, go ahead. Ebert was very funny. I was I was also backstage with him during one of the Emmy awards. He he hosted the Emmys one year with uh, with Oprah Winfrey. Well, that, that, that's an interesting pair, and I guess they dated. It came out. Yeah. yeah. Go figure. Uh, Harry Carey. Mm-hmm. Do you have any memories of him? I know there were a few things you guys did together. Well, um, yeah, he, uh, he um, was involved. We would, we would show up to his restaurant. Uh, Harry did a uh, sort of a charity uh, event up at his restaurant, Harry Carey's, and Roy and I would show up and make an appearance there. He was always very nice. Um, I was up at the uh, the booth at Wrigley a number of times. One one time I came up there and uh, Steve Stone was with him, and Steve Stone always smoked these big cigars. And uh, we're there and the cameras are on and Stone pushes the cigar in my face and he goes, "Care for a cigar, bozo?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, you know, Steve, there's nothing like a good cigar, and that is nothing like a good cigar." <laughs> And Harry Carey almost fell off his chair. He laughed so hard because <laughs> Harry could not stand his cigars. Was Harry the real deal? What you saw was what you got. I think so. Uh, he, uh, you know, he would uh, he'd be backstage with us whenever we would uh, do a charity event or some of that. He was always uh, just a happy guy who, who, who loved what he did. You know, Joey, it's kind of interesting. You you have had a great career. I mean, certainly anybody who's done the Gong Show, you did a great bit uh, that I saw on YouTube today with David Letterman, where you were giving oh. him a tour of uh, Chicago. Chicago. Yes. That was a great. Well, tell me about. Do you have memories of that? That was a very funny bit. That was fun. well. Uh, uh, Letterman came to to Chicago to. In fact, he did his show from the Chicago Theater. And uh, one of the things, that one of his writers, who I guess was a Chicago guy, thought it would be funny to have Bozo uh, give him a tour of the city. So we, we literally spent the whole day in a, in a small van driving all over Chicago, visiting various uh, points of interest. <laughs> what I was getting into there, uh, being on Johnny Carson, which at that time, you know, there were three channels. It was a big deal. Gong Show, same thing. The mm -hmm. the movies you've gotten to do, the great voiceovers you've done, the, the certainly the stage work you've done. Does it ever bother you that when you go on the Internet and search your name at this time, and your career is certainly not over, but if you go on and search your name, that primarily... First and foremost, in people's minds, you're going to be associated with Bozo. Um, no, because uh, that's probably that's probably the largest chunk of my career. Seventeen years as Bozo the Clown, so I'm not surprised that that takes up the largest portion of uh, my identification. Did you like being a clown? You say you were not a clown. Do you feel you became a clown? Um, I. Roy Brown used to say, we're not clowns, we're comedians. We're clowns in the respect that W.C. Fields and Ed Wynn and those guys were clowns. We, clowns, circus clowns, are, are a silent act because when you're playing in an arena, nobody can hear any dialogue. And we were just comedians in clown suits. Um, I've done a few clown conventions. I was in uh, Vincennes, uh, Indiana, uh, a year ago with Robin Urich for the Red Skelton 
uh, clown school. And, um, and we, we, you know, we, we taught some comedy technique. Um, mostly what I did was just tell stories about working with Roy and, and Marshall and, and Robin Europe. But we, we did some technique on pie throwing and things like that. Um, I did a one-man show once on Ed Wynn. And I got notes afterwards from Keenan Wynn, Ed Wynn's son. And he basically said, the thing that you have to remember about Ed Wynn was that he was a clown. And it's true. He was a, he, he was a physical clown, but he was very verbal. And um, there are verbal clowns and there are nonverbal clowns. And most of your verbal clowns were characters that were in burlesque and vaudeville because they had to be verbal. How would you like to be remembered years from now when people look back at the body of work? <sighs> that I made them laugh. You know, it's very unique. Uh, as we have said, a lot of people played Bozo, and certainly there was a creator of Bozo, and there, of course, was a big dispute about that, but we'll leave that for people to search if they want to. Uh, but Bozo's around for a long time, and a lot of people have done Bozo, and I've met a few Bozos, and Bozo still is there occasionally at book signings and things of that nature, if the mm -hmm. approval's given. The thing that I think made your Bozo different, and this is just personal, is that it was the personality. So although they still may pay somebody in, in Chicago to put the suit on, I think there's a lot more to it than that. And I think somebody putting the suit on uh, does not make Bozo. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, it, uh, There have been some very unique fellows who have played Bozo over the years. And I think that that was one of the reasons why Al Hall did not want me to imitate Bob Bell. Bob Bell had his own unique style. <clears throat> and I like to think I had my own unique style as well. I, I think you did, and I think the uh, the thing that maybe is most important to me is, is that uh, but Bozo is such a, a popular figure in, in pop culture that if there ever was some kind of reunion, you know, I think yours would be the one that people do remember because of the convergence of, of cable television partly, but also and being the last one in, in production. But That's also, pretty much it. I was the last clown standing. <laughs> but it, it was a, I mean, you don't last that long. I'm sure if you had came in after Bob Bell and they would have <laughs> went, boy, oh boy, this is, this is wrong, you would have been gone. So to have uh, what, what was it, 17 years, 16 years? Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely something to that. So I, you know, I hope if nothing else, one more time we get to see you as Bozo. Do something. Well, that would be nice. If if if, if asked, I, I wouldn't turn it down. There we go, Joey. Uh, do, oh, go ahead. You mentioned you mentioned uh, if I hadn't been good, I have a story about three months into doing the show. I got a call that the general manager wanted to see me. And he invited me up to his office. He sat me down. He opened up his desk drawer, pulled out <clears throat> four letters, and tossed them across the desk to me and said, read one. So I said, all right. So I opened up the first envelope, and it was, Dear WGN, we hate this new bozo. He's horrible. <laughs> Bring back Bob Bell. And he Rough. said, the other three are just as bad. <laughs> and I went, uh-huh. And he said, this is terrific. <laughs> he said, we had decided that if we got under 100 hate letters, we'd keep you. If we got over 200 hate letters, we'd start to question whether or not we made the right choice. If we got over 300 hate letters, we were going to fire you. Did uh, of course, I'm sure. Tell me about the first time you met Bob Bell. Aha. Bob Bell. I never met Bob Bell until about oh, five or six months into my first season. He was standing backstage, and he had a suit on, and I found myself standing over by him waiting to go on 
for a uh, for an introduction. And as I'm standing there, I notice him smiling at me, and he says, "How's it going, Bose?" And I said, "Oh, very well, sir. Very well indeed." I said, "You'll have to excuse me. We're about to do a game that we call the Grand Prize Game." And I walked away. And as I walked away, he turned to one of the stage hands and went, "He doesn't know who I am." <laughs> So now I was worried. So after we did the grand prize game, I'm backstage with Roy Brown, and I'm saying, the guy in the gray suit, is he some Tribune executive I should know? And he went, that's Bob Bell. <laughs> so, so that was it. it was, oh! <laughs> so that was it. The only time I had ever seen Bob Bell was in a couple of uh, recordings of the Bozo show, and he was in makeup. Did, because he lived, even though he did retire for health reasons, he lived quite a while after you took over oh, yes. Bozo, and some things were even done together. Did he ever say, I like it, I dislike it, I, ha did he ever have any comments on your Bozo? Uh, notes for me? Yeah. No, no, not, not any. Uh, the only time I spent any real time with him was during the 25th anniversary show that we did at the Medina Shrine Temple in downtown uh, Chicago. And uh, we'd be backstage, and uh, he'd throw one-liners at me, and I'd throw them back to him, and he laughed once. He said, well, I see, and he turned to Roy and says, well, I can see why you hired him. <laughs> so <laughs> but that was it. Well, I, I have to tell you, Joey, it, this has been a lot of fun for me. I, I, I have enjoyed these conversations because, honestly, I haven't heard a lot of these stories, and I don't think most people have, and it's it's a really unique uh, treat because, as I say, WGN went into everybody's home, certainly the Gong Show, the Tonight Show as well. Uh, you're very well remembered in the uh, television community. Well, thank you so much. I, I want to ask you one favor, though, before we sign off here. I, I know you can't do, Bozo. Can you sign off in that voice today? <laughs> uh, well, usually I would just say, well, bye-bye. <laughs> and now it's time for the Grand March. <laughs> <laughs> the legendary Joey Dioria. Please come back. Thank you so much. All right. Good to talk with you, Scott. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Scott Spears Now. I know I certainly have. When I was a child growing up in Ohio, cable first coming in, the bozo that I grew up with, 7 a.m. weekday mornings, was Joey Dioria. So it's a great thrill for me to get to talk to him. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. This was kind of a selfish episode, but it was a lot of fun. We are out of here for this episode. I hope you come back with us in the future. By the way, you can catch us on the internet by going to Facebook and searching Scott Spears Now or emailing me, osukid2006 at aol.com. But until next time, this is Scott Spears heading for the dugout.